Creek up. Consciousness slowly returned to me. It's like I'm falling from a cliff so high that clouds are drifting nearby. The ground is coming closer, but I'm not afraid that I'll die. My fall slows down and my body is smoothly immersed into the warm ether. I opened my eyes. You'll sneak through your whole life like this. Lena looked at me seriously. Ah, what? We're there already? Where is there? I looked around. A bench, the square, Genda. But how? I was on the bus going to the district centre. Why are you looking at me as though you've seen a ghost? But we... Why am I still here? For a second I felt terrible fear. Well, I never get out of this place. So we're... On the bus? Together? On the bus? Yesterday? Yesterday? Yes, yesterday. Don't you remember? Lena started thinking. Yesterday. I don't remember anything like that. Maybe you just had a bad dream. Considering all that happened already seems like a hallucination. This must be a dream within a dream, then. Well, let's take it slowly. I tried to think logically. The session ended yesterday, all the pioneers left, but we stayed, and then we took a bus and headed to the district center. Lena surely looked perplexed. Are you kidding me? I am not kidding anyone. Today is the last day. Wait. So how much time have I spent here? Lena started to count off on her fingers. Looks like seven days. Not eight? It's seven. Definitely seven. I gave an exhausted sigh and covered my face with my hands. Well, that's another riddle in the long list of this camp's mysteries. Well, okay. Though I have a feeling that we won't be managed to leave today either. Why? Sixth sense. You're acting a bit strange today. I suppose I have my reasons. Want to tell me? I gazed at her attentively. I do. Sure, why not? When I had a real chance to break through from this camp, everything failed. So what do I have to lose now? Now where do I start? Start from the beginning. Yes, of course. When I was born, I studied, married, uh, well okay, I haven't got married yet. You still have time. Yes, but, well, in a few words, like, I'm not from this world. From the look she gave me, it was clear she didn't understand me at all. I came here accidentally, even I don't know how. So what does your world look like? Selena asked seriously. It's, well, it's virtually the same, but 20 years ahead of your world. Do you already have space flight? Well, if it comes to that, you have it as well. However, we haven't made any great achievement in that field yet. Sounds interesting. I was unable to tell if Lena was taking me seriously or was just pretending to do so. I used to live in a completely different place as well, far away to the north, judging from the landscape, in a big city. I have never been to the big cities. Maybe that's for the best. Will you show me your house? It seemed like she was taking this conversation as seriously as I was. Well, I'm not even sure it exists in this world. Oh, come on! Lena pouted. Well, sure I will. So how do you get there? One evening I took a bus, Route 410, and woke up here. I don't know anything more than that. The 410 route? That's the one that stops just outside the camp. Yes, but... My 410 travels in another place, and time. Are you planning to return? Lena said, and I noticed a note of unhappiness in her voice. I have no idea how to. And if you knew? You're asking tough questions. What's wrong? Nothing, but... You see, I only just recently started to adjust to being here. The first hours in this camp were such a shock for me that I didn't know. It's okay. You still have time to think about it. Time to think? It seems that even if Lena believed me, she considers this whole situation just a typical inconvenience and nothing more. Anyway, it's not up to me. Possibly even if I do want to stay. You see, the one who brought me here can take me back as well. 
I believe that any event in a person's life has a reason. Therefore, you are here for some reason. Maybe. And if you haven't returned, you must be needed here. Well, I can't rule out that interpretation. Hey, time to pack your stuff. The camp leader's voice sounded from afar. Hear that? I don't have much to pack, but I do. So meet you near the bus. Would you like me to help? Thanks, but there's no need. Lena smiled and ran off towards her cabin. I remained sitting on the bench trying to cope with the shock. My thoughts were still in chaos, one theory replacing another. On one hand, me being unable to get out of this camp isn't all that odd compared to me finding myself here in the first place, but... What now? What am I supposed to do? Is there any chance that I can leave the camp if I try again? Anyway, what's the point in being nervous? By now I know perfectly well that absolutely nothing is up to me. Maybe I'll just have to sit back and enjoy the ride. I couldn't help smiling. Especially now when I have an additional reason not to be in any hurry to leave. And that reason is Lena. Maybe she's right and I'm here for some reason. In the end, even if I can't narrow down the possible explanations for my situation to a reasonable minimum, there would still be a thousand and one. And if I keep exhausting myself analysing them, I'll just go mad. Maybe it's time I made a choice. Maybe this world is not so bad after all, especially since for the first time in a long time I have something to live for. It's still a vague something, but I have it. It exists. And now I have the power to not simply hold it, but to develop it into something bigger. With such thoughts, I stood up and started walking to Olga's cabin in order to pack my humble belongings and leave the Sognyhok Pioneer Camp forever. One may think that it's strange, and that's exactly how it seemed to me. But eventually we reached the district centre. I eventually got tired in the bus and fell asleep. When I woke up, I ran up and down the aisle of the bus, gasping for air, but soon I realised that this long week is over. At last, I managed to break free from the camp. All the time I spent there seemed like so much longer than seven days, and now everything is over. Soon after that, events moved with frightening speed. No time left for self-analysis or seeking answers. Moreover, from time to time, I completely forgot about the camp. Like anyone who finds themselves in a completely strange environment, I was completely lost. I had no papers, not even a simple birth certificate, and no skills to earn a living. Professions such as computer specialist or call centre operator were not in demand. Lena returned to her normal life. She had to graduate from school and get ready to enter university. The pioneer camp was in the south of the USSR, just as I'd assumed. Lena lived in a town with a population of about 100,000. It was easy to get there by bus from the district centre. There was nothing special about the town. One big factory, rows of five-storey houses, wooden huts on the outskirts, a grocery store that closed at 7pm and a supermarket. A true Eden for a shopaholic, with choices including rubber winter shoes, wooden women's sheepskin coats and men's musquatch hats. Before I would be, uh, I would already be trying to run away from a place like this, but now it seemed like my home. Cases of starvation were rare in the 20th century Europe. I managed to find a job. I was employed as a turner's assistant in a factory, and was also given a room in a hostel. Over time, this initially difficult and strange job started to bring a certain satisfaction. Partially, of course, that came from having the ability to buy food. Time passed and I climbed up a career ladder, becoming the head of the whole shift. My colleagues were amazed at my talent and persistence, and so was I. Lena graduated from school and I spent several nights with a calculator, designing diagrams of expenses and income, and at last made up my mind to propose to Lena. I don't remember now if it took a lot of time for her to think, if she suggested we sign a marriage contract or if she protested, protested because of the lack of dowry. 
but in a short time both of us moved into a communal apartment room near the factory that cost two-thirds of my salary. Thanks to free Soviet education for everyone, or maybe thanks to my wife's persistence, eventually I became a part-time student at the local Polytechnic University. At first I protested, saying that a fair proletarian needed no need, had no need to act like a lousy intellectuals. But then I came to the conclusion that a diploma would make my life easier. It wasn't difficult to study thanks to my knowledge from the last attempt at receiving a higher education. Time passed and the country started to change. Of course I knew it would happen but still, the changes came out of the blue. You can compare it to being caught in an avalanche in the mountains. You can prepare all you like but it will still bury you anyway. The factory was privatized and then closed down. Moonlighting as a private driver in the Kopje uh, in the rattle trap I inherited from my father-in-law was not really a profitable business. I was even ready to apply for a camp leader position in Sovniok when Lena's distant relative died and left us a one-room apartment somewhere in central Russia. After a family council we decided to move. We greeted the early 90s in a cramped kitchen in... Uh, I'm not even going to try that one watching Swan Lake. Thanks to random side jobs, I saved up some money and we decided to move to a bigger city. And of course, I chose my birthplace. We decided to sell the flat and use the money to invest in business. For some time we lived in luxury, buying mink fur coats and expensive foreign cars, dining in restaurants and taking trips to other countries. Like many others during that time, I had the luck to somehow make it big, starting from the bottom. My business was in construction material retail. It was a profitable market at the time because people made excessive money from that they wanted to invest in luxurious homes. Maybe such life would have gone on, but the 90s were called rakish for a reason. After encountering rackets and corruption, I was left with an empty refrigerator, an empty wallet and the bitter taste of blood in my mouth. That was the time I tried to recall my man from the future status. Betting places were impossible in the Soviet Union, popped up all over, and I rushed to gamble on everything I knew. However, I faced a new disappointment, as matches were won by completely different teams. Even the 1994 World Cup wasn't Brazil. When I was just watching football on TV, everything went as it should, but whenever I spent the last of my money to make a bet, even underdogs began phenomenally beating favourites. As well as that, I tried to pursue a career of a political advisor. However, you don't get accepted into a high position like that without special connections or anything that would make people interested. I don't know how long I would have gone through this torment if not for an event which changed everything. Me and Lena had a child. In a hurry, I started to search for any possible way to earn, earn enough to provide for my family. I remembered some of my father's old friends, and through them, by pretending to be a distant relative of myself, I gained a place as a junior data analyst at a bank. At the same time, I made a new attempt to obtain my disease degree, or to be precise, finish it. Time passed slowly. The money was just enough to fill our stomachs. I almost lived at work for days, trying to find some time for my exams. Lena stayed at home with the baby. That was when I started writing. I remember it as if it was yesterday. It was just after midnight and I was sitting in the kitchen in front of my old worn out I-386, wildly killing monsters in Doom 2. I wanted to sleep badly, but computer games at least slightly distracted me from the infinity of dull days. When I completed another level, I was suddenly immersed in thoughts about how everything I'd gone through during the last few years. It was all too much for one person. That's when I decided to write down everything that had happened to me. I launched the word processor and wrote down about 200 words with the clear intent of continuing it tomorrow. However, I didn't remember it tomorrow, nor even a week later. About a month later, Lena, who was typing something on the computer, reminded me of my unfinished book. I reread it and deleted it, terrified. At that moment, I started to doubt if I could ever do it. 
After all, it was an entire epic novel and I wasn't even able to string two sentences together. In addition, it's not easy to write about yourself. Creative work put on the back burner for now. I celebrated the arrival of the year 2000 as a certified specialist with department head duties. While moving to another apartment, I found my old i386 amongst the trash that was to be thrown away, and I remembered my intention of writing a book about my life. I laughed. How stupid. However, after some time, I opened up my laptop and made a sort of draft of a short story about a young man without a definite occupation or aspirations, who finds himself on a different planet. The style, orthography and punctuation, as well as the idea itself, were matched well to such a silly plot. I showed the story to my wife. She laughed, but said that it was well written and advised me to continue. About a year later, the drawer designated for holding my literary works was full. I found that very odd because I was spending entire days at work, sometimes even during the holidays, and I tried to spend all my available free time with my family. However, that's what happened. Around the time I decided to publish my short stories. As with any other beginner's work, most of mine were rejected, but a couple of them were accepted, including my first work. I was over the moon. Of course, I was paid nothing, but my works will be read, meaning that someone will find them interesting. Time passed. We had a second baby now. During my spare time, I slowly wrote a novel. No, not about my life or the pioneer camp. I decided not to touch on those themes ever again. Everything that happened years ago seemed to be the will of God, whose charity should not be tempted. Who can tell what would have happened if I hadn't woken up on a bus near the Solvunov camp base? A year later, the novel was completed. After I'd known, annoyed almost all known publishers, I managed to reach agreement with a small company. The editor, an elderly man wearing a ragged tweed jacket and thick spectacles, which almost rubbed against his magnificent grey moustache, told me, Your level is average, young man. Average, yes, but the idea itself is interesting. Oh, interesting, yes. Well, you need more practice and, uh, more reading, yes. I remembered these words for the rest of my life. I dispensed the copies that were sent to me as part of my royalty agreement among my friends and colleagues. Lena, who read my novel only after it was published, told me that she really liked it. Mostly out of a desire not to upset me, I guess. Time passed. The calendar days were unstoppably approaching that day when I was pulled out of my usual world and thrown into this life, starting from my mysterious pioneer camp and now ending up here. Now I am a successful writer, at least according to the number of copies my books have sold. I have a wonderful wife and two children. My life has turned 180 degrees. Midnight tonight is the start of something new. Tomorrow is the day I was waiting for for so many years. What are you thinking about? Oh. I opened my eyes and saw Lena. She put a cup of tea on the table near an armchair. Firewood was gently crackling in the fireplace and a snowstorm was roaring outside. I wrapped myself up in a plaid blanket and looked at Lena. Do you know what day it is? No, oh, what day? Do you remember what I told you back there in the camp? No. No wonder. During all these years, I'd never brought up the topic of my mysterious arrival in this world. Do you remember how I told you that I was not from this world? Lena paused. Well, something like that, yes. So today is the day when, many years ago, I got on the 410 bus and woke up at that pioneer camp. So, it's an anniversary. Lena smiled. Yes, yeah, sort of. Is it a sad celebration for you? No, not at all. And I remember almost nothing about that time. Maybe that's for the best. I added some firewood to the fire and took the mug from the table. Maybe I'll write a novel. You will read it and remember. Do you think that's a good idea? Lena's expression became serious. Indeed, I once promised myself that I would never write about it. Maybe it's not. After all, 
everything that happened is just for us. That's exactly what I think. I sighed and looked at the fire. You know, life is like a candle. Sometimes someone's got a short one, someone's got a long one, and it can burn out at any moment. Then our life is like this fireplace. Yes, perhaps. I looked at her and smiled. I'll sleep for a while longer. Lena kissed me and fixed her gaze on the fire in a dreamy manner. My eyes closed and my whole reality compressed itself down to the crackling of the firewood. I started falling slowly, somewhere far away. No, it was not a dream, more like warm ether gently enveloping my entire existence. Yes. Every story has its beginning and its end. Every story has its own outline, synopsis, contents, key points, a prologue and an epilogue. And there is no book which, if you read it again, would not reveal any new details you didn't notice before. Every story has its beginning and its end. Almost every. I don't know about you guys, but that was a hell of a lot better ending than the last one. So, Yelana next? Why not? Okay, I hope you guys have enjoyed this as much as I have. I have really, really enjoyed this playthrough. So, until the next time, I've been Simon Parsons. He's been... He's been Samuel. Thank you, and good night.